Everything I'm going to show you that's live is really live. Nothing is cached on my computer. Um, you'll see why I'm saying that later. Um, so in 1973, when Alan Kay and the other people at Xerox PARC produced the Alto, and later on in the 70s when Negroponte... I can get a definition of these words just by touching them, and the definition will appear in the illustration corner. I can get back to the illustration, but in this case, it's not a single frame. But it's actually a movie of someone coming into the frame. Anyway, uh, between those two events, the Alto and the work that was being done at MIT, it was really clear in the 70s that the media landscape was about to undergo a serious, serious change. And when I say about, I don't mean in the next year, the next two years. I mean over the next many decades. As somebody once pointed out to me, uh, although the printing press started up in the West in 1454, it takes 40 to 50 years before page numbers even start to appear on pages. It takes humans a long time to actually to understand the affordances of new media, but uh, we're getting there. Uh, the only constant is change. And you know how when water is heated up, it looks pretty much like water until just before it starts to steam? Uh, I think we're sort of at that moment. The water's been heating up, and it's about to start to steam. Uh, moving text from the printed page to the screen is, is minor compared to the really big changes that are coming. We've been seeing them coming. We've, no, we've, been no, we've known they're coming. But we're just all the pieces are starting to come together such that the marriage of publishing and computing is about to yield its first offspring. So I just want to go back to the future for one second. And for, for people who maybe here don't know some of my own personal background in this, uh, back in 84, I started a publishing company called Criterion that did special editions of films. We did the first commentary tracks on films, uh, adding supplementary sections, basically adding all the context we could to an iconic uh, cultural warhorse. Uh, this went on to become a fairly successful uh, DVD business. In 1988, we released what I think historically is now known as the first uh, commercially viable at least CD-ROM. It was, a, again, providing context to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. The symphony was there, too. Uh, in 92, we really had uh, the good fortune to, to publish the first e-books. Uh, the first three were Jurassic Park before it came out in paperback, uh, Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Trilogy, and uh, Martin Gardner's Annotated Alice. The next three were uh, for women. It was uh, Back to the Future by uh, Susan Faludi, Marge Piercy's Gone to Soldiers, and my favorite, the first double feature, uh, Brave New World, uh, paired with Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death. When we put these out in 1992, they were on, a, uh, they were on floppy disks. But you'll notice from this picture on the left-hand side that we actually enabled you to write in the margin then, and also to put vertical marks in the margin. Um, John Scully actually, uh, I'm going to borrow cats instead of taking my computer. John, John Scully used to fly me around the world that year so that I could lie down on stages and show that I could read in bed and turn pages uh, with my finger, um, which I wanted to do actually because I was trying to make a statement that in the future, we were all going to be reading on screens. Um, publishers respected me at the time, but they really didn't understand what that had to do with them. Uh, I think, I do wonder now how different the world would be if publishers had sort of grasped in 1992 that it had everything to do with them, because perhaps it wouldn't have been Amazon that had released the Kindle, or Apple that had released uh, the, the tablet and iBooks, but perhaps a consortium of publishers uh, would have worked either together or maybe with Sony or somebody to, to, to jumpstart a business that they could have and should have, I think, owned. Um, so I, I left publishing in uh, 1996, mostly because I didn't understand what it meant to be a publisher at that point, and because I felt that we just didn't have the right tools. 
and I sort of have spent the last uh, 15 years both building tools and then I spent five years in the middle with, this fa with a fabulous grant from the MacArthur Foundation where uh, we did the, uh, had the Institute for the Future of the Book and in, in about, five, little, about five and a half years ago we released the first networked book uh, which really was just an attempt to, uh, to enable readers to have a conversation in the margin of a book. And I'll show you one example of this. Uh, this was the last experiment we did. Uh, it's Doris Lessing's Golden Notebook. Just after she won the Nobel Prize, I got these seven women uh, to spend six weeks reading the book together. They didn't know each other. On the left-hand side, you see the text of a page from the book, and on the right-hand side, you see the conversation that these women had just about this one page. It was a fantastic experience for them. They all wanted to do it again. Uh, it proved to us, sort of incontrovertibly, the viability of the asynchronous reading group, that not only could you read with people where you were separated by time and space, but it was actually uh, quite a wonderful experience, quite, quite a rich experience. Um, so back to keynote, okay. So what did we learn all these years? Um, in the second, uh, so you have to, basically during this period, spent the first 15 years sort of trying to understand about expanding the page, the notion of a page to include audio, video, and code. And the, the second years, aside from tool building, really trying to understand what happened when you put a text online that the social aspects come forward and that a book becomes a place, a place where, where readers can congregate, sometimes even with the author. We also realized that the core competencies of publishers in the future will include managing editorial content that includes a range of expressive media and the ability to build and nurture communities of interest. We learned that as the value of content heads towards zero, what people will pay for is context and community. Uh, I, I understand these are headlines. Um, I'd love to talk to people about it much more in depth later. Um, lastly, and this was sort of the late, one of the later things we understood, was that you can't just change the shape of the work. You've got to rethink the whole ecosystem. When we were making CD-ROMs, we'd put them into boxes, and when, then we'd put them into tower and water stones, uh, et cetera and uh, Barnes and & Noble, and people would come and they'd see the boxes, but there was no way to browse them. In other words, we had changed the work, but we hadn't changed the rest of the ecosystem that would have been necessary to enable people to really, to build a market around it. So, that brings us to Social Book, which is what I'm, I'm doing now. And this is a completely romantic, sort of unbelievably, um, this unbelievably romantic idea that we can build a platform for publishing in the networked era. And we're, gonna, we're trying to work on the whole ball of wax. Um, first of all, everything is going to be in the browser, completely as to the app world for a whole lot of reasons, not the least of which is that apps kind of reproduce one of the sad things about uh, the print world, which is that each book lives by itself as an island and not together. We live in an open web today, and I think that our media should be in there too. We're going to reinvent the bookstore. If I have time, I'm going to talk to you about that. We're working on tools, as we have for a long time. They're going to make it relatively easy to assemble, assemble complex and elegant EPUB 3 documents. Those are the ones that can have a lot of interactivity and where you can control the, 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 the page in, in its entirety. And we're going to make a stab at a completely new publishing model as well. Um, so first I want to talk about the reading experience we're developing. And I'll show it to you in a minute. One thing is, is that we're, we're actually, I think, have the, by far the coolest reader around right now. But one of the things that we're really working on is to make social reading a reality. And we've identified four flavors of social reading. Uh, the first is being able to read with people you know. 
So uh, this is me reading with five other people, and e each of us has been marking up the page, and the highlights and the graphical marks that we've made in the margin, those can all contain notes underneath them. But we also realize that there's a discussion that goes on more broadly than just between you and your friends. And so there's a tab, the community tab, and if you click on that, it actually gives you a ranked list of all of the other people, of the comments of all of the other people who are reading the same document. So what's happened is my, my group's notes have just been swapped out for another group's notes. Um, we realized one day that if, if in, in social book you can actually be a group of one and I can mark up a book, underline you know, 80 passages, uh, put notes in there, and we realized that, wow, if that person were the author of, of a piece or maybe a, an expert, that that person would have created a gloss. And that then there's the possibility of importing somebody's gloss into a book that you're reading. Uh, wouldn't it be, I mean, I, I for one, I, we read uh, Tale of Two Cities not too long ago and was thinking, I would just love to read the analysis of an historian of this book. And so think of a gloss as an in-book in purchase, where you can go and pay an extra $3 to get a, uh, a gloss by a particular expert. Uh, so th th these are actually just, th these, this is a book with three different, well, actually has many more glosses. And you can scan those. You can try one. You can decide to buy it. The last flavor of social reading is when the author or an expert actually appears inside the book. Right? There's no reason why uh, a publisher couldn't announce next Thursday so-and-so is going to uh, give a, a live reading, and if you just open up your copy of the book, whether it's a sample or the book itself, uh, you'll have access to this live reading. You'll be able to ask questions live, etc. It's also a place, interestingly enough, where um, think about being able to buy a textbook for your child that comes with 20 hours of tutoring inside the book, okay, live tutoring one-to-one, -one, where the pages of the book are there, and your child can point to something on the page and say, I don't understand this equation, and the person on the other end uh, will be able to talk with you uh, live. When we say a book, a book can become a place, a book can also become a marketplace, a, pl a place where, where, where value can be exchanged within the pages. Uh, I think I'm gonna, I want to show you social book before I run out of time here. Um, so, show you some cool things. Um, let me go to my library. And so, one of my. One of my favorite things about a book being in a browser is that if it's Chrome anyway, it'll translate. And as you know, Chrome's translation has gotten pretty good. So suddenly, there's a whole universe of literature that's potentially available to me if I can get it into a, a decent uh, browser-based uh, reader. Um, another really cool thing about this particular reader is, look at this. Look how fast I'm turning pages. This is not cached, I promise you. I just loaded it onto my machine. And it's not, and, and it even works, it even works that fast. If there are pictures on the page. Again, not cached. That's how good this reader is. Um, I want to show you, um, I'm gonna, well, let me do, let me do one thing really quickly. Here's the, here's a, a book I'm reading with, uh, two other people, and I just want to show you the richness of the conversation that can go on. You'll, you'll see here there are, there are two different uh, colors of blue. If I, th that means that there's more than one, more than one of us has actually 
uh, highlighted this and, and written what we call an initiating comment. So what you see here is Octavia Butler's, this is her comment that she's written. Over here on the left, this is the, the text that she actually highlighted. If I switch to my icon, um, you now see the text that I highlighted. And if you switch to Lanny Bud's, you'll see his. Uh, the down below, this is Octavia Butler's response to Lanny, and Lanny's response back to Octavia. Or if we go back here, uh, this is Lanny's response to me, Octavia's to him. We've enabled extremely rich, threaded conversation. Um, I know that for many of you, many of you are thinking, oh my god, how will I ever get time to do this? I don't have time to do anything else. What we notice are two things. First of all, you won't know how cool this is till you do it. It's quite experiential. The other thing is what we, what we think is that um, our consumption of media is going to go in two different directions. Some things we're going to spend a lot more time with than other things. Some things we're going to go out into deeply, and some things we're going to go into much less deeply. Think about the gloss for a second. If I'm able to buy Steve Pinker's new book on, on, uh, on the history of violence, it's an 800-page book. If I could buy it with a really, really good gloss in it, I could probably skim that book intelligently in a night. So that's a book that I might just read very, I might skim, but skim it way more intelligently than I could on my own, whereas something else that's closer to, to my interests I might spend a lot more time with. Um, I want to go here. I want to go to Safari for a minute. And this is a web page that I, I just selected the text on it. And I'm going to go up here, and I'm going to go uh, to Services. And I'm going to go Create EPUB with Selected Text. And I'm going to call this Assange. And it's about, it's an interview with Assange by Hans Ulbrich Obrist. And then I'm going to go back to social book. And I'm going to go to my library. And I'm going to upload. And I'm going to choose. And there's Assange EPUB, and it's 3.22 AM, which is the right time for here, so you know that it really is the one I just made. I'm putting, I'm putting that in there. I'm going to upload it. I'm going to choose a cover. I, I actually, I did make a cover beforehand, because I didn't think you needed to watch me do that. Um, it only took me a minute to do that. Uh, I could type in a whole bunch of metadata here. I'm not going to. I'm going to publish that. And if I now go to my, uh, I can start a group around that. And I could put in some emails here. If I hit create group, it's going to send out an email to people who are going to be able to join me. Um, it's actually. OK. And then the really cool thing is that that book is now ready for me to start marking up. And if I bothered to go to the other address and accept the invitation, my, the person I invited would be here with me. OK, we've, we've worked really hard to make it very, very easy to put things into social book, um, which has a lot to do with our general idea, which is that a platform has to be for everyone, and it, um, it, it has to be really easy to use. I want to let me go back to how much more time do I have, Kat? None. None. Uh, five minutes? Three? Two. You're, you're harsh. Um, OK. Uh, social bookstore, um, we're going to try to completely change. We're going to try to bring the serendipity that exists in brick and mortar stores into online bookstores. 
Foils, remember foils? They used to stock books by publisher. They've stopped doing that. There's absolutely no reason why an online bookstore couldn't let you see books by off, by publisher and by subject matter. Not only that, we're going to allow publishers to brand their pages in the store. We really see publishers as, our, as potential partners here. Uh, we, we think you should be able to, publishers need their brands to, to be known and to be uh, more valuable. Publishing model, I can't go into it, it just takes too long, but it's, it's the most radical thing we've come up with. Um, Sophie are the tools that, that we've got, and again, if anybody wants a demonstration, they're, they're quite phenomenal. We've now got them outputting to the iPad. Uh, I want to just finish, this is another, another 30 seconds. Um, this is the centenary of Marshall McLuhan's birth, and I just wanted to play a 30 second clip of his. When in any new form it comes into the uh, foreground of things, we naturally look at it through the old uh, yes. stereos. Yes, we can't right. help that. This is normal, and we're still trying to see how will our, our previous pol political and educational patterns persist under television. Uh, instead, we're, we're just trying to fit the old things into the new form, instead of asking, what is the new form going to do to all the assumptions we had before? McLuhan and others realized that the actual mechanisms of communication have a huge impact on society. And so not only are the forms of expression changing, what we change them into is going to have a huge impact on human society going forward. I just say that because I, I just want to try to impart this idea that what we are doing has implications beyond our businesses. It has implications for how human society is going to evolve in the next you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. So what we're doing is important, and I wish you a fantastic conference. Onward.